Okay, uh, welcome uh, to uh, Friday public talk um, at A3. So, you know, in the public imagination, conservation in India has been spectacular success. More tigers, wildlife, and, and then you're flooded with a lot of uh, media attention on the wild scene, tourism, and everything. So it's been a it's been a success all around. Over the years, though, our own conversations with mostly in BRT, uh, with Soligal, the Adivasi in BRT, paints a very different picture of what's happening in the landscape. And uh, work that ecologists in A3 have done over the long term also also shows the same areas, these protected areas, these, uh, these iconic landscapes, wildlife and conservation and wild and, and, and forest, pristineness. Um, have actually transformed. These were areas that uh, people lived in, they farmed, cultivated, worshipped at sacred sites, burned, managed in ways that uh, made their life, um, you know, facilitated their life in that. In the, in the last 40 years or so, uh, you produce a completely different landscape. And at the heart of this intervention has been this idea that nature and society can't co coexist. So the, the nature and people and landscapes have been prized apart, produce these extremely uh, hybrid sort of landscapes, unrecognizable almost landscapes. And um, and you know, in a 2012 paper, Mara Goldman uh, calls these as uh, uh, conservation opportunities lost. In some sense, it's a it's a very evocative idea that. You know, we've taken an opportunity for con conserving these landscapes, for moving along, producing more of these sorts of uh, interesting lived-in landscapes, and, and lost that amazing opportunity to, to continue to have a, a country, a region-wide landscape of lived landscape rather than contested landscape. And, and, uh, and Mara's work as a political ecologist um, has, has investigated or explored these ideas in Africa We'll hear a lot about this, a lot about this today. And she she introduced me to this paper only last week, and uh, I wish I'd seen it earlier. If I had, Mara would have been here earlier, and uh, and uh, we'd have had a lot more interactions along these lines. Um, so therefore, not lose any more time in listening to Mara today. Mara Goldman is a associate professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and uh, she works in the political ecology of such transformations amongst the Maasai. Uh, a more vicarious connection with Mara is that uh, she did her PhD under Matt Turner, the University of Wisconsin Madison. And Matt Turner is a name many of our PhD students are familiar with. Um, Matt Turner and Sharad Lele, who's been a very big influence on my own life, um, went to school in Berkeley together. Right? And, uh, and another connection is my, my wife, Muttu, was Matt Turner's master's student at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So, so it's really nice to have Mara here to talk about issues around conservation, but also political ecology and a whole range of other issues. So with that, Mara, here's the floor. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to use this. Does that work? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Nitin, for the invitation. And thanks for facilitating um, my application to come here. I contacted Nitin, I don't know a while back, and he's been very patient with me trying to figure out, I knew I wanted to come, but I wasn't quite sure how to make it work or what I wanted to do. And I'm in some ways still figuring that out. Um, those of you that are PhD students just starting, that might sound odd. Those of you that are like in the throes of your research know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you put together a really good proposal and then you get to where you're supposed to be and then it's still sort of starts to all bubble up and, and change in a lot of ways. So the purpose of the talk today is really to situate myself, introduce myself to all of you, tell you who I am and what I do, the work that I have done up to, day, to now, which is sort of the way, the lens through which I look at everything. And it's in, I'll tell you, almost every conversation we have, or even my first visit to BRT was like, my, I compare it to what I know and what I've seen in Tanzania and Kenya, where I've worked for almost two decades now. Um, but it also gives you a framing for sort of how I see the world. And then, I will um, close with some um, thoughts about the research that I'm going to do here, at least what's been laid out, and again, which is a little bit sort of up in the air still because it's changing as I continue to talk to people and learn. 
but again, we'll give you an idea of what I'm doing here and why I'm here, because I'm hoping to talk to many of you during the time um, that I am here as part of the research, but then also just for opening up, you know, um, avenues for new conversations and collaborations. So what I'm going to first do, um, well, actually, what I want to say first is the title of the talk, Crossing Borders and Performing Conservation, Knowledge, Participation, and Governance in Community-Based Conservation. I'll mostly be speaking today about the border crossings, a lot less on the performing of conservation, although I use it purposely um, as a bit provocative to suggest that conservation is a performance, and I'm happy to talk more about that um, in the questions if I don't get at it enough in the talk. But I also want to say that I came up with this title first, and then I saw the copy of the book that just came out, Celebrating Atri at 20 Years, and it was really exciting. Sort of the title is called Transcending Borders or Boundaries. I am a geographer, but I very problematically use those two words almost the same. So call me on it if you would like. But, um, but it made me realize that this is really a great place for me to be. This is exactly where I should be. Um, because we're talking, I'm talking about many of the same things and many of the same sorts of border crossing processes. ATRI as an interdisciplinary um, research and practice institution is very much about border crossing in the sense of interdisciplinary work. And it was exciting for me to actually see that discussed as boundary or border crossing, because most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's discussed as just sort of interdisciplinary collaborations. But I think it's much more fruitful to talk about it as border crossing. Um, and that's a big focus of my talk today is the value that we get in sort of recognizing borders everywhere that they exist, not taking them for granted, not assuming that they're discrete and permanent and obvious and always there, but asking why they're there, what work they do, what work they don't do, and where we stand on the border, right? And so I am a social scientist. I engage with ecologists. I have done ecological fieldwork, but that matters for how I approach ecological fieldwork and how I talk to ecologists. And it's the same um, in the other direction. And I think it makes, it helps a lot when we start to recognize the border and where we stand on it when we approach any sort of question, whether it's ecological, whether it's academic, or whether it's um, about this larger border crossing question that Intin just raised, which is the border between nature and society and, um, and where it lies. So I'm gonna start with just um, situating my work academically. So Nitin mentioned my association with Matt Turner. He was my PhD advisor. We co-edited this book together and along with Paul Nadashti, who at the time was an um, anthropology professor at the University of Wisconsin and is now at Cornell. All of us were interested in these questions of sort of using political ecology as an interdisciplinary social science field, a study, if you will, but also more thoroughly integrating it with uh, science and technology studies, right? And so, the, um, and I'm not going to go into too much depth of this, but again, I'm happy to talk more about it towards the end. But one of the, the main things that we were raising in this book was that in general, and most of the time, political ecologists are concerned with what happens on the ground with the politics involved in the application of particular forms of knowledge. So for instance, the application of the Western model of fortress conservation, right? And what happens on the ground when rights are, are um, denied, people are excluded from their land and so forth. Science studies or science and technology studies is another interdisciplinary social science field that is mostly concerned with the politics involved in the production of knowledge. So we're looking at not taking knowledge for granted, not taking science for granted, unpacking science as just another form of knowledge production and looking at how particular forms of knowledge get produced in the lab, in the field, and then how certain knowledge translates and circulates more so than others. And so how is it that certain models take shape and then become seen as fact and others don't. And we, um, when working in through this volume, recognize that you cannot sort of, to, rigor to rigorously look at conservation issues, or not just conservation, environmental management in general, the politics of environmental knowledge. In order to do it rigorously, you actually need to look at all those angles. You can start from one, but you can't sort of do a complete picture without looping back through all of them. And this will become clear as I go through the talk. That wasn't supposed to happen. Oh, it's doing one of these automated. Oh my goodness. Okay. So there is that. So now, well, that's sort of pushing me forward so that I move on, I guess. Now what I'm gonna do is talk, get sort of more to the exciting stuff, situate my, my research um, geographically. So as Nitin mentioned, my work has been um, to date pretty most, um, in East Africa, in Tanzania and Kenya. Okay, I have to just stop this for a second and make sure that it's not on auto 
uh, why it's doing that. Any? Okay, hopefully. So I work in East Africa, mostly in Tanzania and Kenya, which is out. Mm, still doing it. I don't know why it will be doing that. I had to change that. Um, setup show. Present device paper full screen. Oh, manually. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, so Tanzania and Kenya, these areas are all inhabited by Maasai. Maasai are traditionally pastoralists or agro-pastoralists, meaning that most of them perform some form of cultivation now, but still see themselves predominantly as pastoralists, relying on livestock, cattle, sheep, and goats, and donkeys. Um, and they they straddle the border of Tanzania and Kenya. This black line is the border. And all these yellow boxes are areas that are sort of world-renowned conservation areas. Serengeti National Park is inside the, the Serengeti Mara ecosystem, which crosses the border, um, in which I was not named after pure coincidence. <laughs> Kitsangela is an area right outside Nairobi National Park, which is an absolutely amazing national park that's up against this unbelievable mega city. although the future of it is at great risk now that they've planned a um, train to go right through, a railway to go right through it. Um, Amboseli National Park, most of you have probably heard of. Longino, less, but it's a right up against um, Lake Natron, which is a famous um, soda lake, home of migratory flamingo, also a volcano, Aldonio Langai there. And, um, and then Tarangiri Manyara National Park. Tarangiri and Manyara National Parks. And so the areas I'll focus on most in the photos are gonna be Tarangiri Manyara, where I've worked most of the time. Although I will also, you'll see photos of all these areas. They all share um, ecologically, they're all um, categorized as semi-arid e uh, savanna ecosystems, slight variations with some areas like Serengeti and Mara being much wetter than the Longido and Amboseli areas being drier. All those savanna ecosystems characterized by a great deal of variability in rainfall in time and space. All also with a long history of land loss, um, by Maasai predominantly, but other communities as well in the area, land lost two national parks and other protected spaces. And because of that long and continual proactive um, politics of resource use and control. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit to show you some pictures of these places and the sort of border crossings that are involved all the time between what we consider nature and society. I use this picture all the time for classes without the title to ask them what kind of landscape this is. One would imagine you're inside a national park. This is entirely village space. Villages in Tanzania are just administrative units that um, now they can have legal status as a land unit with, well, they've always had legal status, but they can now have land rights as a village, come up with a village land use plan, and then they can do what they would like inside that village space. Um, sometimes they have a school, they have areas that are for um, settlement and so forth, but there's nothing otherwise that we recognize as a village. They can be fairly open, particularly if they're Maasai and most of this land is used for grazing for cattle as well. This is a really, I mean, it's a horrible map, but it's a fantastic illustration of the problems that arise from conservation borders. And so this is really just a photograph of data, um, aerial survey data of surveying wildlife numbers. So you have the large dots, the circles are wildlife numbers, the larger they are, the more wildlife. And the outline here, the dark outline is uh, Tarangiri National Park, this other one is a newly created wildlife reserve. And then over here, all these numbers of wildlife are inside Lake Manyara National Park, a very narrow park right up against the, the, um, the lake. So you can see here, you have all of the wildlife, or most of the wildlife are inside both parks. That is a, and that in some ways is why the border is drawn the way it is. This picture was taken in the dry season. Tarangiri National Park, like most national parks in Tanzania, and it sounds like in India as well, began during the colonial era as hunting reserves. And so what did you want? You wanted places that you could drive to so that you could get to in the dry season where all the animals were. And so they were all clustered around Tarangiri River, which is the only permanent source of water in the dry season. So that's why there are so many wildlife. But this is what happens in the wet season. The park is empty. Because all of the pasture land outside of the park is much more valuable. There's been 
Logical studies that show that the land is the, the pasture is more nutritious, very much needed for wildebeest in particular when they're calving and when they're giving birth. So the wildebeest come and sort of the zebra and gazelles and sort of the succession of grazing, but other animals come out as well, predators obviously, and elephants and giraffe. And you see a lot of the animals in between the two parks as well. So again, this is a picture of that. This is that space over here, which is gonna come up much later in the talk, an incredibly important space called the Simanjiro Plains that is entirely populated by Maasai mostly, some other migratory groups in there and um, village space. There's no actual conservation area there. And then this is um, an area in between the two national parks, which is called, so it's west of um, Tarangiri and it's referred to as the Kwakuchinja Corridor. We're using the word corridor to refer to the spaces in between the two parks. And I've, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the problematic nature of the term corridor, which I've written some about. But right now, this is just to show you again, a space where wildlife and livestock are in fact co-using the landscape, village space. This is outside um, Maasai Mara Game Reserve in Kenya, where you can see Maasai homesteads, sheep, and then wildebeest right there. This is outside Amboseli National Park in Kenya. Outside Nairobi National Park, also in Kenya, obviously. Nairobi National Park is fenced all along the top. The only part that is open is the part that is adjacent to the Maasai area, to the south, which is becoming much less Maasai. It's, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And this is one of the most, my, one of my favorite photos because it really challenges this idea of what we consider nature and society. We can all sort of say, well, maybe cows, you know, but you have wildlife, um, in fact, up right up against um, what is basically peri-urbanization happening against the, the park boundary. But of course, boundary crossing ha happens both directions, right? It's not as easy nor as accepted for, for Maasai to go into protected areas with their livestock. It's illegal for them to go inside national parks. Even during droughts, there's been attempts to, to change that, always contested. People have different ways of managing it, usually um, selling some small stock and keeping a lot of cash in their pocket to pay off the guards so that they can graze through the parks or going at night. Some studies, um, Bilal Butts did some really great work in Maasai Mara talking about the ways in which Maasai manage their cattle and grazing into the Mara in the evening or completely transforming their, um, their grazing practices to avoid the park borders. Some of the ecology is recognized as not being so bad, but sometimes it's the tourists who don't want to see cattle inside the park. This particular case is interesting and I'll spend some more time talking about this in the couple examples I'm going to give. This is the example that Nitin was talking about um, a conservation area, a conservation opportunity lost. It's the Manara Ranch is actually a conservation area. It became a conservation area in 2011, but it was previously, prior to that it was, um, Maasai didn't live inside of it, but they had always used it historically for grazing. So they continued to do so. And this was sometimes legally, sometimes illegally. This was illegally grazing inside the, park, the ranch. So what do we make of all these border crossings, right? One could say, well, this sort of highlights the fact that these borders don't really do any work. Wildlife and livestock cross the borders. So, so maybe we should rethink how we approach conservation. Unfortunately, that's not usually the reaction, particularly from conservationists. The first reaction is to create new borders. So usually this is in the form of new conservation areas or corridors, which I refer to as conservation areas because corridors, at least in Tanzania, they are, they're, they're being pushed by conservation, um, by conservationists, scientists and practitioners. There's now a new, uh, new line in the new wildlife policy um, that enabling land to be allocated for corridors. And they usually do not allow any human use inside of them, right? So I'm gonna cover this really quickly a little bit. Um, one of, so one of the first, one of the ways in which you to find out that about border crossing is through the next approach that I'm going to put up, which is sort of this increased surveillance. And so there's surveillance of people, but there's surveillance of wildlife. Where are they going? So this is some data collected by a, a group of researchers from, um, from Italy working with wildlife authorities in Tanzania to track the movements of wildlife. And so you can see you've got all the arrows, they refer to them as corridors, even though they're really just movement pathways. And then they try to come up with kernel, doing a kernel analysis to figure out what's the home range, where are these animals, so that they can say, these are really important areas and we should protect them, is basically the goal. And then they call these um, corridors. And in the end, you have focus on this particular area between the two national parks as a corridor, as well as this area out to the Simanjaro Plains that I showed you. 
okay? I focused particularly on what's called the Quokka-Chinja corridor, and I have a paper that, um, in, um, on this 2009 paper. And what I do, and this gets back to this sort of the need to kind of include this up approach that looks at production, application, and circulation of knowledge, right? So here I was in an area where wildlife were mixing with livestock everywhere. People were coming in to propose conservation, um, a conservation corridor, and people, and it was backfiring, right? And so you have, in some ways, the application of the knowledge itself. So in, um, I'm going to go back to this one over here in this area that I mentioned, semen drill plains, it's so important. It's also highly politicized conservationists. People very freshly remember getting kicked out of Terengiri National Park. There are issues about the border shifting as well. Um, and so when they started talking about the need to build a corridor, they said, well, where's the corridor going to go? They have to build a conservation area then. That's only going to come next. So polit politicians took it to their advantage, and they started to sort of politicize it even more and convince Maasai to claim the land so that it wouldn't become conservation. So literally, you had people planting in the corridor, meaning the area where wildlife moved through, so that it wouldn't become a corridor in the sense of a new conservation area. So completely backfired in the sense of um, protecting space for wildlife. And you can't talk about corridors out there at all. In this area, it was a lot less political, but still a project came in to focus on corridor creation and people, it just didn't make any sense. And this is the words from one Maasai elder who said, you're coming here to this village to talk about corridors. And then he went on to say, well, it doesn't make sense because the corridor doesn't stop here. This isn't a corridor, it goes all the way here and there and there, and why aren't you working there as well? And then he said, we should just call it grazing areas. <laughs> and the project should be to improve the places where the animals stay. Or maybe you could call the project helping those people who stay with wildlife and mix with them. We need to be talking about improving this relationship and this land and not about carving out or protecting a corridor. And so what I do in this analysis is that I'm not going to go into too much depth here is, but again, to say, okay, well, we can see the politics, but then why are we pushing corridors when even within the conservation biology crowd, you had people stopping and raising a red flag and saying, hold on, let's not all jump onto the corridor bandwagon. It doesn't always work in all situations. But there was something about corridors that were easily translatable, easily transferable. It came with this huge package of conservation tools. You could use GPS and, and um, at markers and you could map it. You could even just do it from home in a desk in the United States by using remote sensing imagery. Um, and, uh, and GPS tracking of elephants, or even without it, if you wanted to do a corridor based on vegetation. There were lots of ways in which it, it worked. And so it was being pushed through. It also worked with the Tanzanian, um, very territorial-based focus for wildlife conservation. So there were many reasons why it worked that didn't raise, that left sort of the questions, even for conservation ecologists, unanswered as to why we're not looking at other things, that there isn't as easy of a language to talk about, such as, wildlife and livestock co-use of the landscape. Right? And like I mentioned, in some cases it had detrimental effects. In this case, they just said no to the project. In the other case, they literally sort of created an uninhabitable landscape for wildlife in that space. Um, another way that conservationists are often looking, and I'm, I'm using the word conservation is very broadly. In Tanzania, at least, there's a large overlap between Conservation science, oftentimes related to big cat, which I know you have here too. People that are studying lion, uh, tigers, not tigers, <laughs> that's here. Lions, in particular, lion conservationists or elephant conservationists, or um, and then connected to the different wildlife authorities in Tanzania. Unlike India and Tanzania, it's all wildlife focused. So it's the Wildlife Authority and the National Park Service that has a great deal of power. And a huge amount of power lies with outside conservation agencies, WWF, AWF, IUCN, Frankfurt Zoological Society. So better surveillance is another way. I mentioned this already. Surveillance of wildlife is often used to protect to, for the first option, but the other, um, but also better surveillance of people. So what are wildlife doing in spaces outside of the park and how can we then protect them? And what are people doing when they go into the park and how can we find them? And so you have the introduction of drones as well as community scouts, community scouts outside parks to kind of keep track of their own so transferring of guns from guards to community members. And now uh, increased promotion of drones to follow poachers and then to have sort of real-time detection of, of poaching activity, um, as well as promoting drones for, for the use of, um, for wildlife research to follow the movement patterns of wildlife, right? So again, back, we can think about the application, the potential 
applications of this on the ground. Um, I have a paper that's in the works. It's been in the works for about a year, so maybe. <laughs> but that's looking at some of this coming out of Tanzania. What's going to happen to community relations that have already been built with um, conservation agencies when all of a sudden you start to have drones flying? And that's sort of the application aspect. You also have drones can't tell the difference between a herder and a necessarily, they might be able to, but a herder and a poacher, if they have a gun or a spear over their shoulder. And from the perspective of one drone, op one of the companies operating drones, I was told it doesn't matter. They're both poachers, they're inside the park. So then if you go back to this, you have the, you know, the same system of sending out, um, sending out patrols to arrest that, that person, right? But then there are also questions of the production of knowledge. What kind of knowledge is produced through drone technology that's different than on the ground knowledge? And what happens when we question those, ask those kinds of questions. And then finally, um, community-based conservation, right? And this is the, the sort of the model that we're all a little bit more comfortable with, I think, in this room. And it's what we often think of as a really good way to deal with border crossing. And it's going to be the focus for much of the rest of the talk. But as I have argued, and I think others have as well, um, and I actually made some changes, but it looks like my updates didn't end up up here. The, um, the paper that um, Nitsin was talking about is actually 2011, and it's in the journal that comes out of ATRI, Conservation and Society. And it's on this particular area, the Manara Ranch. Um, and I argue in there and elsewhere, and others have as well, that community-based conservation, we often assume that it's gonna kind of make this bridge. But many times, community-based conservation rebuilds boundaries inside community spaces, right? And obviously there's many different forms of community-based conservation. And I'm gonna cover some of them a little bit and then some a little bit more in depth. The first one, benefit sharing, is sort of the, the least um, or the most um, passive, you could say, right? And it's the most obvious form of actual, of community-based conservation just reinforcing boundaries, right? The boundary of the protected area is over there we will give you something over here in the community to make sure that you respect that boundary. At least that's the way it plays out in Tanzania, usually through the building of a school or a clinic, right? Just communities on the outside of the boundary to respect the boundary. These are some of the other forms that it takes, or at least that I outline. Um, some of you in this room might have other takes on it, and I'm happy to hear about those as well. I'm gonna go through these a little bit more in depth, each one. At least, well, not necessarily the last one, the local Game Scouts, which I've already covered a little bit. So awareness training, oh, yeah, oh, something, okay, there we go. Awareness raising. Awareness raising, I'd like to say, is just one notch up from benefit sharing because it sort of assumes that, okay, this is conservation, it's outside of society, it's outside of the community, and we're gonna teach you about it and, and how to protect it. Sometimes it's not necessarily about the bounded space, but it's about the wildlife or the nature within the spaces in which the communities exist. Right. And um, what's problematic, I mean, I understand that sometimes it's important. Sometimes you are dealing with semi, um, with peri-urban communities or migrant communities that in fact don't know the areas, the area that well and might not have an, an appreciation for the local ecologies. In which case an awareness raising about why there's this new conservation area is incredibly important. Or it might be awareness raising about new laws. Okay, you're no longer allowed to cut the forest and this is why, right? But sometimes awareness raising comes through as a way of teaching one particular view of the world and way to conserve without first asking what the existing one already is. And that was again, um, drawing from my work in Tanzania, the work that I saw going on with communities regarding Maasai lion hunting. And so I have down here just two papers on that. Um, this, I'm just gonna be able to give it really um, briefly here, but Maasai are pastoralists, they don't hunt. Historically, they have not hunted one of the reasons why there are so many large numbers of wildlife in their lands. Um, historically though, they have considered wildlife as quote, second cattle. It's a term that's used in the sense of during um, extreme droughts and hunger time, they can, if absolutely needed, hunt wildlife to live on. But for the most part, they don't hunt wildlife and hunting is seen as being some, is frowned upon, except for lions. So there's a, there is a very ritualistic um, lion hunt that occurs, right? And um, it happens in a ritualistic way with a man of this age set with spears. The Maasai are just as much at risk of being hurt as the lion is. And um, it's also done when lions prey on cattle, okay? 
a group of lion researchers and lion um, conservationists in Kenya were basically very upset with what they saw as declining lion numbers and felt that Maasai needed to be taught that they have to protect lions. And so they start with awareness raising. One, to teach them to appreciate lions and two, to teach them to not lose so much cattle. So to have better homesteads, to have better grazing techniques so that the lions won't attack their cattle, right? Our research, so I did research to contest this because I found the whole thing a little bit disturbing. Um, and so we had, we specifically then did some questions. We did a comparison with somebody uh, that had worked in Kenya for a long time. And then I re had a student return to some questions in Tanzania. So the case examined Kenya and Tanzania. And we found that, you know, there's an entirely different way of approaching lions that Maasai have that one has to get outside of the boxes of Western perspectives of lions to even get at. So if you start off with are lions good or bad, well, they're somewhere in the middle. You know, Maasai had this unbelievable appreciation and respect and admiration for lions, but they also hated lions. And just like Westerners or Indians or affluent Africans that are going to, there was, we had one woman say, if I could tie a lion to a tree and look at it all day, I would, they're beautiful creatures. Well, that's what we do when we visit lions in zoos. It's a different matter when they steal your livestock or threaten your children, right? But also it was about understanding the relationship between lions and, and people that did not draw lines between nature and society. So Maasai saw lion hunting as about maintaining a relationship between lions and Moran, which are these warrior groups, a relationship that was based on mutual respect and fear and taught the lions to respect people and to not steal cattle. And people complained, particularly in Kenya, that when, that, when, when there was a restriction on hunting and they were not allowed to hunt, that all of a sudden there was a rise in lion hunting of livestock and of people that had never happened before. So a disruption in the relationship. But go, even going there to, demands a recognition of thinking and being with nature differently than a Western perspective of understanding lions. And then participatory planning, which we can think about as, so I'm still on kind of taking divergence into different areas of work that I've done, but all related to community-based conservation. So we're on this list of different forms of community-based conservation, right? Participatory planning is much, sort of we're moving down, you know, up the ladder if you kind of use this notion of um, more participatory. Participatory planning is more, you would imagine, much more active, right? It's about bringing people on board, participatory processes for planning. And this is that paper that Natin was talking about. My um, questions here though are, well, yes, it can be, but it all depends on who's participating. Are the women participating? Are the, is it just men? Are they just elders? Are they just educated ones? Are they just the elite? Who's participating? How are they participating? When are they participating? And these are not new questions. Lots of people have asked these questions, right? Um, because they're not just for conservation, but also for development. But then also, again, this, what, would, what would happen if we were to reconceive of participatory uh, planning as boundary crossing exercise, right? So uh, then we would recognize that we're almost always going to be talking about epistemological boundaries, people knowing things differently, right? How one knows. We're also gonna be talking about ontological boundaries, what the world is, right? And so the, the discussion about the lions, we, there were different ways of knowing lions, different ways of tracking them, but also different ways of understanding lions and nature society relations that are ontological. They're not just epistemological. They're different ways of being in the world. The world is a different place for Maasai and a conservation scientist, right? And what does that mean if we actually recognize that? And then communication. And so I spent two years observing participatory meetings in this one conservation area. So this was a conservation area run by a board of directors, but there was a steering committee of representatives from the villages and they would have these meetings. And I watched these meetings and I watched meetings happen in Maasai communities by themselves and meetings with outsiders from other organizations. And I realized that there were actually, in addition to different ways of knowing and different ways of being, there were different ways of communicating. And I know you all know that because you all live in India, which is like everybody's, you know, there's in one sentence, you can combine three different languages, right? Or more. <laughs> And language conveys things in different ways, but it's not just about language, it's about how one speaks to a crowd, how gender dynamics, women, whether women can speak in front of men, whether somebody can speak at all when one person has said, this is what I think, now it's your turn to decide. All, so it's about power dynamics, but it's about more than that. It's about recognizing that there's different ways of communicating. And again, what happens if we start to recognize that there is a communication challenge and we have to sort of work at border crossing 
in multiple ways, as opposed to just thinking that if we bring everybody to the table, then everybody will be able to talk freely, right? And so I, I did some work on this in particular, and much of this work is being, was just drafted into a manuscript, which deals a lot with this, drawing from Maasai customary forms of, of communication to sort of try and talk, try and build dialogues in different ways. And then finally, co-management or co-producing knowledge, one would think is sort of the highest level of, of, of sort of uh, participatory planning of you know, taking it even further to say, well, rest, there's differences in knowledge and we're going to build new knowledge together. And absolutely, and I agree with that. And then I think that that is where we should be moving. But I also, as you, I'm a little, you know, I tend to always have a slightly critical eye. And so again, to think about, well, what's going, are we just taking for granted that we can just bring everybody together and then co-produce knowledge? And much of the work going on right now in co-production, not so much, it's much more common in the in um, climate knowledge production than it is in conservation right now, the language. But a lot of it tends to, to collapse differences into this language of collaboration. So if we just bring everybody together, then we can co-produce knowledge. But again, what happens if we start off with recognizing boundaries and the question of when were boundaries created and for what reasons? We can recognize that we have people using different kinds of knowledge. So for instance, this is somebody working with me collecting ecological data using Western ecological methods, but also his Maasai knowledge about being able to detect different plants. And then these are Maasai on their own working as game scouts and using a GPS unit to, to, um, to document a boundary in their landscape, right? In both cases, they're using Western techniques, not because they have to, to know what they know, but because the Western techniques have, you know, have uh, value that their traditional knowledge doesn't. So there's a historical hierarchy of knowledge that started with colonialism and that continues today that is always present, right? And so it means that when we have co-management projects, we're often talking about fitting indigenous knowledge into a scientific model and how to do that, right? And so again, what would happen if we started without with saying, you know, with recognizing where differences exist and why, when the boundaries were drawn between knowledge systems, with what implications and where would that take us in terms of um, co-production practices, right? And then actually I was wrong, finally is payment for ecosystem services. So this is a final form of, of uh, community-based conservation that I'm going to address. And I don't, you might get the idea now that I like to just go through the things and then sort of tear them apart and critique them. And I am a critical social scientist, so I do like to critique, but my goal is to critique for improvement, right? To say we can't just take this as for granted and where can we move to, to improve. Um, but payment for ecosystem services, I think not everybody sees this as another form of community-based conservation. Some see it as different. I think it's, we can see it as community-based conservation because it's out, it takes place most of the time outside of protected spaces. It's another mechanism for understanding how to deal with border crossing. How can we protect the wildlife that are in that space? Or how can we protect that landscape to make sure it stays uh, valuable or accessible to wildlife, right? And so, I want to suggest that ecosystem services assumes on the one that you do have this nature outside of society that you can put a dollar sign on. So it's a very interesting relationship because on the one hand, you're bringing nature into, you know, sort of capitalist culture by saying, let's value it in a very um, monetized way. But in order to do that, it's recognized as something outside of us, outside of society that can give society value. On the other hand, the boundaries between communities and conservation agencies are often not fully acknowledged or addressed, right? This history of the boundary drawing and how the boundary created new sets of relations, right? So one of the things I didn't talk about so much here is that, you know, the boundaries have an impact, right? So the boundaries of the national park change the relationship that people have with nature. So you might have for Maasai, like for instance, the lions, now Maasai are killing lions at higher rates. Maasai kill lions in protest to say, these aren't our lions anymore, they're your lions, they're lions of the state, we're gonna kill them because you're not paying enough attention to us, right? Or wildlife crossing a boundary that previously wasn't there to graze now um, on, inside a park and wild Maasai feeling free to shoot those wildlife because they're now wildlife of the state. So you change the relationship by putting in a boundary. And sometimes those relations themselves are not necessarily acknowledged when you talk about introduce a new ecosystem services project. So what I'm going to do is sort of briefly go through um, three examples. It's basically outlined in this paper that um, recently came out that tries to, to challenge the idea that ecosystem services is the best way to go. And it was a, 
example that, um, so three examples that seem really simple, right? We have one that has no payment for ecosystem services and that's the Manara Ranch and has been by all standards, social standards, a failure. Conservation status, yeah, wildlife numbers have gone up, but it's not necessarily sustainable or in the long term. And then two um, that have PES that have been very successful. So you would say, okay, well, great, it's, a, it's PES works, but our suggestion is that if you look underneath a little bit, it's a lot more complex. So the first example is the Manara Ranch. This is just a better map to show you, if you can recall, Tarangiri National Park here, Lake Manara there. And here's the Manara Ranch. This whole area is referred to as a corridor. These are the two villages that I worked in that historically used to lay claim to Manara Ranch. It was their land, long history of giving it away to a, to a white rancher and then having it become conservation, having it become state land and then conservation land, right? It became conservation land in 2002 through a process that they thought they were involved in. The villagers said they want the land back. They went to the president to ask for it back. And they were told, they were lied to by their member of parliament that it's been given back to you. When in fact, the member of parliament was, was made the head, the chairman of the board of the Tantalian Land Conservation Trust, which was a, a joint um, collaboration with the African Wildlife Foundation. And they had a lease for 99 years on the land. Steering committee was really only there as in sort of, um, they were guidance, but they weren't, they didn't have to be listened to. And this is what the, what, if you went online, you know, this is the, what the Manara Ranch advertised itself as. It was going to be a community conservation area, a wildlife corridor. There were still cattle in the ranch and um, educational center tourism and so on. And it's often advertised as it was sort of the AWF's model for the land trust model for conservation working in Tanzania. Okay, am I okay with time? I mean, I'm sort of, I was told 45 minutes. Yeah. Oh, no, okay. Hmm? okay. Oh, I am? Oh, mine's is 30, but okay. So I'll try to go through this quickly, but basically the, the model was really framed on a lack of trust. Clearly there was deception from the beginning they only hired a liaison officer at the end. I mean, not at the end, after things got started and Masai started to ask questions and he was from a, a different tribe that had a history of conflict. Um, they policed boundaries. Basically, Masai weren't allowed in except for on a limited basis in a way that completely challenged Masai ways of managing livestock. They had to take a photograph of their livestock and count their livestock and, and request permission. During drought times, Maasai have a system of reciprocity. Any other Maasai cannot be denied access to pasture. Maasai came in from Kenya. Maasai came in from all over Tanzania in 2009. They were told that they needed to get rid of them. Not only did they arrest them when they came into the ranch, they insisted that Maasai and the villages remove their, their visiting. So there was this complete challenge of social norms. Aggressively went out after lion hunting saying you're not allowed to hunt lions, which there's actually some leg room, there is some wiggle room in the Tanzanian um, government um, regulations for that. If the lion has attacked livestock, then they are officially allowed to hunt the lion. So in response, people start, people basically said to me, we have no reason to respect the Manara Ranch. Manara Ranch doesn't respect us. So, oh, so you can see, it's hard to see here, but you have an increase um, in lion and illegal grazing and illegal burning. They used to historically burn the area. So now that they weren't allowed to burn, they would just sort of burn and not manage, sort of burn and run away. Um, and you can see here how this was, you know, this changed relationship um, with wildlife conservation authorities. One her, um, elder says, I don't have um, a problem with wildlife and not that want them, here, nor do I like tourists because I don't see them. Wildlife on the side of the tourists aren't the problem. It's the people who protect the wildlife who are the problem. And so I've just discussed the whole problem with the border effects, right? So now the Manara Ranch is seen as a border that people are not happy with. And so treating it differently because of that. So I would ask people during my time, and this was early on, this was my dissertation work, actually 2002 to 2004, what would you do if you could have run the ranch? And many of them had a lot of ideas because they had talked about this. They thought they were going to run it. They had sort of, it had been stolen out from under them. And they talked about it being a place of wildlife and, and livestock, no farming, just grazing that they would regulate the grazing like a reserve. It's the strongest form of um, traditional management that exists for Maasai. It's only allowed, grazing is only allowed in an alalili during um, drought time or for sick, or, um, or calves, sick cattle or calves. We, the elders, can do it better than the government can. We can set up a, such a grazing arrangement 
in the village in the wet season in the dry season grazing areas. And so basically and seeing it as part of their entire grazing system instead of something outside of it. The area has actually been now been returned to them. It's a long story and it's mostly political, but it's still questionable about whether or not they're going to be able to do anything. Legally, it's been returned to them, but they have nothing has changed in terms of the actual status. But they have been fighting for it to be returned to them ever since it started. And then two other examples, and I'll go through these pretty quickly. This is that Simanjiro area I mentioned, really important for wildlife um, grazing in the wet season. So you had a group of, and so this is a picture of the plains, a group of people came together, um, Maasai themselves, working together with a conservation, uh, well, a tourism organization that has been working in the area for about 20 years, started community-based conservation there, a local NGO that's all about um, indigenous rights to land. Um, this is an area that's not only important for wildlife, but it's important for livestock too. And I mentioned villages get land titles, and once a village has a land title, then it can divide up its land. And so that's what's happening. People are getting individual parcels for grazing, for farms, and they're losing access to grazing land. People are coming even from outside. And so what the Seaman easement did was to say, well, we'll help you protect that land. And wildlife and livestock can both graze on it. So you have, um, basically it helped the village to protect the land. So rather than taking land away from the village, it helped the village to keep land intact for wildlife and livestock. So it didn't make a distinction between domestic and wildlife. The only um, restrictions are on farming, building and um, digging. So no water holes can be put there because then that would radically change the, the landscape. Villages um, get money. So it is, they do get payment. They get payment to keep the land open because they needed that. But then they get to decide how the money is used. They decide the management system and they have all of the, um, they have the workers patrolling the area. And again, built on a history of trust, communication and respect. And they have a liaison officer from the community um, there since the beginning. And then the third, and, and it's been a success in the sense of all the neighboring villages have asked to join on. So it's expanded in size because the plains expand all of the, about six villages, not just one. And the third case is from Kitangela. So this you have, um, there's Nairobi National Park. All these are dispersal areas of, of wildlife outside. I mean, these are core movements of animals and then a dispersal area of wildlife outside the park. Just like in Tanzania, even more so in Kitangela, because Kenya, the land is privately owned. So the land, well, Maasai land has been slowly in many areas. It was used to be group owned, now it's private land, and then they divide up the parcels and many of them sell them. Particularly near Nairobi, it's incredibly high prices of, for land out here, right? So people are selling land for wealth and poverty. And that means, and when people sell the land, usually farmers buy the land and they put up fences. So they worked in collaboration with a research institute, ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute, together with the um, Landowners Association, oh, sorry, and a community and a conservation agency to first figure out where all the fences were and then take the fences down. So rather than putting up boundaries, they were being paid to actually take the boundaries down and then to sort of keep the land open for wildlife and livestock. So again, you had people needing access to this land themselves, but not having the capacity to do it. Again, success being measured on, from social perspectives here, the area increased dramatically in size. And then I had some other numbers, it's gone up ever since. Um, and people found that the money was very useful in terms of not having to sell land to pay for school fees and so forth. So again, so to close this example, you have these two we suggest are successful, not because of payments for ecosystem services, but because of basically enabling tenure security for the, for the land um, users, grazing access by wildlife and livestock. So not basically putting up a boundary between what's considered natural and what's considered social from the perspective of wildlife livestock, which is very unusual from a conservation perspective. Payments were seen as a means to control the land for grazing, not as basically the reason for success. It kept land in Maasai hands and available for livestock. And it was also built with relations of trust and, and mutual respect. Okay. So what does all this have to do with boundaries, right? One, I suggest that um, does CBC reinforce boundaries between nature and society, or is it possible to work with other ways of doing conservation? For instance, having space for wildlife and livestock. In the beginning, I showed you all these pictures of wildlife outside mixing with livestock, and 
and gave you different examples and of the ways in which usually the approach is to again segregate an area for for wildlife outside of um, Maasai Mara. You know, there's more, tourists are going outside to see wildlife. And one of the first reactions is then for tour companies to come into villages and say, we'd like to set up a conservancy. And the first thing that a conservancy does is separate an area that's only for wildlife. So there continues to be this sort of notion that wildlife need their own space because they're natural and they need to be kept separate from people. And then also does CBC in, in its various guises reinforce power dynamics between science and other ways of knowing and being with nature? science and indigenous, mass and conservation, or are there other sort of border crossing techniques that are possible? Whether it's in participatory dialogues or in co-management techniques, they can all reinforce the borders if we don't first recognize that they exist and then talk about border crossing instead. And so just to close, I wanna to jump to what I'll be doing here. And this is pretty short because I haven't really started anything yet. <laughs> I was obviously, I went to visit BRT, so there's a lovely picture of this beautiful place. Um, this is the title of my Fulbright proposal, Situating Biodiversity Conservation, Knowledge Participation and Governance in Community-Based Conservation Initiatives. And to just kind of tie it into what I've just been talking about, I think there are some really fascinating questions about where and how boundaries are drawn in BRT and elsewhere. This picture of it itself encapsulates, you know, sort of nature and society in the temple, right? But then you also have a wild boar right here eating the trash by the side of the temple. So it also encapsulates how difficult it is to draw that boundary, even more so here. Um, so how are we, how are boundaries being drawn between nature and society? Differently by different groups of people. Soliga, different Soliga, people at Atri, different people at Atri, Forest Service, the conservation agencies. Um, indigenous communities and others, you know, being again the, from the outside, it's hard for me to to notice necessarily the difference. Maasai stand out as being quote unquote indigenous. They're indigenous in political terms only. So Maasai are actually one of the most recent immigrants in that particular area. They came down and kicked out other people um, that were there before them. In Africa, you know, there's, they're all, in, you know, it's indigenous or not. If you're a black African, then you're pretty much indigenous. But in Tanzania doesn't officially recognize the indigenous status, but they use it as a political card to gain um, international support and they use it to say that they are indigenous because they're marginalized so they practice a livelihood pastoralism that is not supported by a predominantly agricultural state they still maintain particular traditional rights and wear traditional clothes and have a language none of which are supported by the state and therefore they should have rights to particular places and access right here it's very different but i know it's also highly political right who gets considered indigenous and what does that mean in terms of rights um, and the other groups that also I saw working and living around and in BRT. Um, and then science and other ways of knowing and being with nature. Um, and then again, to sort of park on this question of like nature, the nature society boundary, you know, you can say, well, this is clearly capturing nature in a nice photograph, but then what is this? One would say the same thing until I found out what this all was, right? The lantana that's invading that was planted, right? And so is this a natural landscape and who gets to decide that? And so these are some questions that I know many of you here are working on. And so what I'm trying to do now is just sort of figure out where I can fit and what I can contribute to the conversation. Um, and it also includes really complex and interesting questions about knowledge rights and management that are tied up in all those border questions, right? My proposal outlines looking at knowledge production as something that happens here at Atri as a foundational institution for teaching conservation, right? So on the one hand, is all of you students, how are you learning about conservation and knowledge and, and, uh, and difference and different ways of knowing and being in nature, is that part of the syllabus? How does that then play out when you go to the ground? On the other level, there's an unbelievable amount of production of knowledge by scholarship here at Atri that shows, for instance, challenges some of the forms of management happening in places like BRT. What's happening to that knowledge? How is it being circulated? And if not, why, right? Um, how is it being applied? What's going on? And you know, what happens if the attempt to apply that, whether through forestry, with the forestry service, or through management plans with Soliga? So I'm interested in that interface and those in overlapping areas. Um, and then that also question. I mean, this I had in case I had extra time, but I'm going to skip that. I can go. Just going to go to my concluding. Concluding. All right. Um, and so again, just to kind of wrap up with the boundary theme, paying attention to difference 
within and across boundaries, paying attention to how boundaries are drawn, when, with what impacts, why, and work on, um, and the work that they do in changing relations on the ground between people and institutions, between people and nature, or what we call nature. And so then, um, and this is a, a, a lot up here, but it basically says that we're, you know, again, the differences, I'm talking about all kinds of differences, not just different ways of knowing, but different ways of being, which I think is really important when we're talking about indigenous communities, um, but also how those differences are changing. You know, we can't box an indigenous community into something that they used to be or something that we think they should be. And I think, again, if we start to focus on how we are also drawing boundaries and the kind of border crossings we need to do to better communicate with whoever we're studying, then that might help with that question. And that requires focus on communication, positionality, and politics. And then these are just Maasai sayings, um, but that's not really. So thank you. Um, much of this is based on the work from all of these, the work in Tanzania, and then here in India, it's a Fulbright Narrow, and then Atri, of course, and Nitin for the facilitation. So that's Swahili, Ma, and then Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a lot, but hopefully there's sparked some spaces for questions. And so I was wondering if you had to ask a Maasai person, where do they see themselves in 40 years? And I think the reason is, you know, what really strikes me throughout the talk is so much of how the Maasai feel kind of characterized as sort of frozen in time. While I'm sure the Maasai want water and sanitation and the other standard development stuff, right? Which also means, or probably we're talking, yeah, I don't know, maybe they don't want all of those things, but, and which you can tell me, but uh, if they do, then that means that the Maasai today are going to be quite different from 30 years. And this is the same thing that I, I, I feel equally for the Biyaki. Yeah. But I just wonder whether, if, we had to ask these people, you know, where they want their children to be and where they think the community will be in 30 years. Yeah, what what would they answer and then how would you then would you then rethink some things in, in that changing process? No, that's a great question. That's why I have this up here, right? So what does it mean to be indigenous, right? Does it mean stuck in time, right? And I would actually say like to rather talk about them as being skilled border boundary crossers. Right. And so I think I had, you know, an, um, so I start off my, my manuscript, which is really all about this, with a really long discussion. It's sort of a, a long narrative about one individual who both worked inside the Manara Ranch as a game scout and had a farm on the boundary of the ranch where he had, um, you know, he would use poison arrows to shoot animals, right? And I use it as an example to say that I think there's, there's a tendency to assume linear change, right? And so that... They want to be just like us, and therefore they can no longer do what they are always doing, and everything's going to change. And I think it's a lot more complex. Like, so there are this particular Maasai individual cared about conservation inside the ranch. Outside the ranch, he shot them on his farm, right? Some of that's about the boundary, but he also, but it wasn't even that simple, right? He also helped me in some of my research. He also, there were times when he was actively involved in keeping Maasai. Um, warriors from going on a lion hunt. There were times when he joined them on a hunt because he was furious about some of the politics involved. So I think that, you know, we, that it's, people make, they make choices, right? And, and um, sometimes it's a, the awareness raising part is interesting and important for helping, I think, figure out how, what choices are going to have what kinds of impacts, but I don't think there's necessarily just a linear change, right? So Maasai still dress like this because it's the most comfortable and because they like it, but many of them dress in slacks and shirts. And um, most of them wear slacks and shirts when they go to the city and come back and wear this at home. So they're, they're crossing those borders all the time. There are Maasai that, work, that make their living working for NGOs in the city. When there was the largest drought in living memory, everybody left their job and went home because the most important thing in the world was keeping their cattle alive. Maasai farm so that they don't have to sell livestock to buy corn. So yes, they eat more corn now than they used to, but they farm so that they don't have to sell their livestock so they can still be pastoralists. So it's not, you know, oh, they're all becoming agriculturists, right? Um, you have many, for instance, building new cement houses, um, and then you have, but doing it in exactly the same structure that they have their normal house. So every wife gets a house and they do it to the left and the right the same way they do it. So I feel like there's, there needs to be more space 
for us to have conversations about you know, how people become sort of these very skilled border crossers or boundary crossers and the decisions they, they can make in that process, right? So the example of the Terat easement, they weren't ready to divide up their, all their land. They want to have a private plot. They want to have their kids go to school. Some kids go to school, some kids stay home to herd. So you have increased um, differentiation happening in communities. You have poor families members often hurting for richer family members who will send their kids to school. Everybody wants their kids to go to school to get a better um, life. But that doesn't mean that they want to give up their land or stop being pastoralists. And so I th think a lot of the organizations are working with trying to fill, find middle ground. So in that one village, people are saying, okay, I'm going to have my farm and I'm going to build my house. But where now, all of a sudden, it took time to realize, where am I going to graze my cattle? So then there was this option of a collaboration with a conservation agency to say, hey, we can help you have a space to graze your cattle. And sometimes it takes going so far to realize that you want to come back and then that's often too late. So um, that's a place where I think awareness raising in the sense of you know having people visit different communities. I've worked with Maasai visiting Kenya and seeing what's happening there, coming back and saying, oh my God, they've divided all their land. They have no space to graze. We don't want to be like that. But at the same time, you know, moving in certain directions. So yeah, they're changing and I think it's complicated, but I think it's not unidirectional. Was that? Extension of that question and uh, the comment that you made. Uh, also, uh, I was wondering I mean, if, if you have a if you have a community that is changing so you know sort of interestingly in all kinds of directions, does it also then mean that there is a certain amount of fishing that is taking place? So you don't therefore have a sort of a collective uh, knowledge base from which you you know your traditions and so on sort of emerge, uh, you know, because of this you know, rather haphazard uh, divisioning that's taking place in the site. Does that make sense? Divisioning, you mean? Like, uh, no, I mean, if, 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 so for example, if, if, if a few in the society think that um, you know, being with the conservation group uh, you know, makes sense for, mm. for how they should you know, um, be with wildlife, be with so doesn't that sort of in a very short period of time, doesn't that add to a certain visioning, you know, um, in terms of knowledge that's being generated within the community. So there's no one single or uh, yeah. Well, I don't think, yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, that's why I have this. I don't think there is such a thing as timeless knowledge. Knowledge has always changed, and it always changes. And, of course, it's changing faster now. Um, but that's why, you know, when I talk about different, I, there is no such thing as the Maasai, and I tend to do that here. But, I mean, in reality, I talk about them as being differences in different locations. They have different names um, for Kisongo Maasai, mostly in Tanzania. There's Perko Masai and the Serengeti, and you know, there are slight differences. But at the same time, they've been coming together as a group from advocacy perspective to lay claim to traditions and land, because there's a great deal of, of um, continuity across. Um, so again, there's like, as things lose, right? So as more changes are happening, you're always going to have, um, there are always gonna be differences, right? And so they have their own mechanisms and their own techniques to come up with decision-making that incorporate or deal with those differences, right? And then you have, um, right now there's a movement by, there's a huge transformation in customary leadership that's happening to actually almost mirror the Tanzanian leadership system. But at the same time, they're getting a lot of support from this one particular community-based organization to say, okay, this is customary leadership, but there's a lot of things you don't know. Like you don't know the land law and you don't know the wildlife law. And these are the ways that they impact your community. As a group of customary leaders, we can help bring you together to talk about these things so that you then have some foundation to work from. And so again, it's this sort of working on change while also talking about how to maintain a life of pastoralists. They're not going to all be able to support themselves on this land. So that means that some people work as laborers, some people have jobs in the city and so forth, but there's always this desire to also maintain the land to some extent as well.
And so in terms of knowledge differences, you have elders saying, you know, the last drought. So I've written about like from an adaptation perspective, how there's this assumption that climate change adaptation learned from pastoralists, they've always adapted with this assumption that their knowledge is still completely the way it always was and we can just use it. And I talk about how much of the knowledge is changing because people can't move the way they used to. They can't move to the places they used to. And so now it's not just knowing where to go, it's having money, it's having connections with non-Masai, it's having access to a motorcycle, it's all these new techniques. They're still moving, they're doing it differently. So different people have that knowledge. It's not only the elders. The elders say, well, in the past, the only people that survived this drought were the ones that went into Tarangiri National Park and ate live wildlife. Today, the only people that will survive are the ones that are working in town, right? And so you have shifts. And so again, that's why I think it's important to not think about it as timeless, but to sort of recognize that things are, but at the other hand, not think it's all gone, which tends to be, you know, I've seen these co-production practices and people say, oh, they don't know anything anymore because now they're not, they're, they're not, you know, traditional anymore. And I think that's another danger too. And that's a big challenge, I think, here because Solig are far from traditional. I mean, they don't, they haven't been doing what they historically did for how many years now? Since the 70s, right? So that's where I'm, I'm fascinated with how then one begins to talk about indigenous management. But I do think it's possible to, to, to try and find some way where it's not one end or the other. No, who should I? Yeah, where? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to share oh, from keep on the this. perspective of culture conservation, which is what I deal with. Mm. And uh, some of the, I've sort of been around and come back to but changing my views on, on how to approach that. And with respect to uh, the transboundary issues and because vultures, some of them nest on cliffs, some of them nest in trees, which may be more mobile than the cliff nesting ones, but uh, they're generally moving 50 kilometers during a day routinely, mm. and often further, and through some satellite tracking we've done. Uh, ones, we're finding one or two are going a whole lot further, 400 kilometers a month, which um, so when you're trying to develop strategies for conserving them and get ownership of, by local communities, of course, and I was interested in your point about um, the um, getting the surveillance mm. improved, because I think actually to get people um, thinking about them communicating some of these movements is really important for sharing that. I mean, actually, we're learning a lot anyway. But we, we had a recent um, dilemma locally that the only vulture sanctuary in the country designated is uh, Grand Magaran, <clears throat> which was where there were a few pairs of vultures breeding and putting a fence around a relatively small area of species which is actually foraging 40, 50 kilometers away. In some ways, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I, didn't, I was not terribly um, enthusiastic about that initially. But I've been following this quite closely. And, and in fact, you've got to start somewhere. And you've got some sort of ownership going on of those birds. But then expanding that with the knowledge of, of where the birds are going and you know, the approach that's needed, you've got to get veterinary drugs controlled in a well, 100 kilometer radius minimum, actually, to, uh, to actually conserve them. So, um, but, uh, but uh, going back to the Nepal India boundary, where we've got some initiatives going on. Um, and of course, transboundary, it, it's a bit of a, a buzz thing in, in many ways, particularly because um, I was interested in your use of wildlife. I, I think that wildlife can be uh, you know, insects or whatever, but. Intensity of there, you know. But actually, trying to 
jump on the initiatives of Transboundary Corporation on a national boundary mm. level is something that uh, is quite new to wildlife authorities here. They're used to dealing with it for elephants or tigers, but not, not for vultures and, uh, and other things. But, so, um, but, but I think, uh, well, anyway, I found it very interesting. I, I'm not quite sure where it's gone, but I was just saying that I uh, wanted to say really that um, my own perspective on, on the use of boundaries has, has gone completely circular in, in mm. thinking that it does give you a useful starting point uh, sometimes, and yeah, I know you're talking about boundaries in lots of different ways. Here, but, you know, yeah, um, can you tell me, I mean, I should ask everybody to say their name because I don't know anybody and so it helps me to figure out where people are and... Yeah, I'm not so, actually yeah, yeah, so, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so um, you're at a, from a local, from a conservation? From a um, NGO, oh. Okay, great. So just a quick response to that is I think, I'm not suggesting that we eliminate boundaries or that they can't be blurred. I'm just